everyone, and welcome to the MPS Show Reviews. I am Jim Skork, and with me I have Norman Sanso. Hello, guys. How are you doing? And awesome brony reviewer, Silver Quill. I had a book room once. It was delicious. <laughs> were you eating a book or were you eating an apple? Well, I was, I was enjoying a nice book with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. <laughs> <laughs> was it written by Thomas Harris? <laughs> No, that just gives me indigestion. Ah, <laughs> uh, dear. Yeah, I can feel. I feel for you. Ugh, that man is not a good writer. <laughs> and, then um, a, and then you have a George R. R. Martin book, and it just tastes like your tears. <laughs> it uh, tastes like murder and <laughs> violence uh, and lots of nudity. Anyway, <laughs> we are today going to review the Bookworm arc. That is SMLP comic issues. Uh, 18 and 19, is it, guys? It's I completely lost track of the numbers. 15 and 16. 15 and 16, there we go. Oh, gosh, and I don't even remember who wrote this one. Hang on a minute. I completely misplaced my wiki, my wiki page. It's the same group who did the pirate arcs. We have uh, head writer Heather Neufer, mm-hmm. an art by Brenda Hickey and Amy Meberson. And colorist by Heather Brickell. In actually, in actuality, yeah, that's that, that's right. Art style is different uh, because it's uh, uh, oh, hang on, Amy Meberson uh, doing the art, but yeah, same writer as the pirate arc, correct? Another so comic, okay. another comic starring Twilight, Twilight Alicorn. Yay! <laughs> yeah, so thankfully, we moved, we moved past the initial outrage. Rage. <laughs> Just a, a nice, uh, a nice uh, unguent to uh, soothe those uh, hurt bats. But this is the this is what the comic is about. Uh, one day, out of nowhere, Twilight is reading her book and she realizes that is eaten away by she doesn't know what. And she comes back to her library to discover that almost all of her books have been devoured. And quickly, she figures out that it's a worm that has sneaked in the library. And at the same time, there are some weird cocoons appearing all over Ponyville. So in order to stop this worm, Twilight and her friends decide to step inside the books themselves. So they get themselves into the adventures. Only to realize that the characters that are in these books, they have been eaten and then spewed out into the real world through those cocoons. So it's only a matter of time before the entire the entirety of Equestria gets invaded by all of these book book characters. Unless Twilight and her friends do something about it. How was that? It was pretty good. It was a pretty good synopsis. Okay. okay. Very well done. <laughs> Sorry. Totally wing it. <laughs> Yay. So, yeah. Uh, before before we go deeper into the review of it, uh, guys, uh, you have to know that there are spoilers ahead. That's why I didn't spoil the ending. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, we're going to talk about it now. If you haven't read it, pause it here and go read it because this is actually one of the... One of the most worthy uh, comics to read, hmm. at least when it comes to when it comes to content, at, at least for me. But yeah, from now on, spoilers. We're gonna give you a ten second uh, uh, delay. So if you have, if you keep listening and you haven't read it, it's entirely your problem. You cannot hmm. blame us. So, ten, nine. Yeah, that's it. Eight. No, that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's ten seconds on my planet. Okay. <laughs> So, what do you think? Well, uh, I'm going to leave myself to the end like I always do, and I'm going to let you guys go ahead and and give your opinions. So, go for it. All right. So, I'm going to say that the art style for this one is new, and it's pretty interesting. I I like the uh, I like Twilight's expression in this book. It's all over the place. It's like the first page already sold it to me where she's depressing or she's stressing out where her book got eaten. And in the last panel there, she faints priceless. They, they do a lot with uh, Twilight here, like how she freaks out. <laughs> Twilight freaking out is always my favorite thing to do or see. Yeah. <laughs> Silver? Well, see, the, my greatest enjoyment with this comic is seeing uh, our heroines taking on all these different genres. Uh, and it's just all over the place. One minute they're fairy tale, Robin Hood adventurers, the next they're uh, Indiana Jones or Daring Do, exploits, sci fi, zombies, Lord of the Rings, you name it. Everything uh, is on the table and nothing is off limits. 
uh, which is just fun to see. Uh, I will say that this may have started a trend in the comics as we've had a lot more of those genre crossing moments. And after a while, that can almost seem like, okay, guys, this is fun, but you're kind of forgetting my little pony in this. Hmm. Uh, so I, I fear the comics are going too far, but in this comic, it was a nice self-contained reference. But the thing that keeps me from perhaps being as uh, enthusiastic as James is the rules of this story mm-hmm. and the, the chain of events. Um, I was at a writing conference and a speaker was talking about the difference between science fiction and fantasy, something that people often just sort of assume it's all the same. And funny enough, there's a Star Trek reference in here. But sci-fi is factual, and even if you've made a fake science, you have to explain the rules of it for your audience to uh, appreciate. Fantasy is more faith-based. People, You say it's magic, and people will just sort of roll with it. But with this story... You say, oh, it's magic. Okay, I'll accept that there's this magical bookworm eating the books. But then characters are coming out of pods and uh, they can suddenly control the dreamscape and all this stuff is happening. And I'm just like, wait, why? Yeah. It's almost, it's almost, it's almost taking too much on faith. I need a little, I need some understanding as to what this bookworm really is all about. Yeah, I I do agree with you with that. Like to me, the book kind of broke, like or not really broke, but the, to me, the book kind of fell apart during the appearance of Daring Do. Like during that, from that point on, it kind of broke apart and it tried to glue things back together. But you have to take a lot of liberty with the story to kind of really enjoy it. And you, and you bring up a good point, the double-edged sword that is continuity. Yeah, uh, I mean... Oh, God, yeah. Okay. Yes. I am t- so far, I am giving you guys all of that, but I completely agree on the continuity issue. Yeah. Okay, if Darindu is a real character according oh, no. to the show, why is she coming out of the book? No, okay, um, let me explain this to you from my point of view, because what happened in the book or the novel is... The bookworm is eating characters. The bookworm is eating the book and somehow magically putting them in cocoon and turning them into real life. So there's yeah, a, yeah. another daring do out there doing real things. Like this one here should have not known or, well, it looks like they don't really know the main six because they haven't met before. Uh, but but here's, here's where that can run into a roadblock. Uh, when daring do first emerges from her pod, which... I'm not sure if this is supposed to be an invasion of body snatchers uh, <laughs> reference. Uh, Applejack is talking to her, asking, What in tarnation are you doing here? And Darren says, Tell the truth. Are you working for Aoi Zodal? Aoi, what's he? Working, now, not looking. Work, uh, are you working for Aoi, Aoi Zodal? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm reading, I, I've got the page in front of me. And I could accept that this is the Darren from the story, not the Darren that met. But Applejack, assuming this has happened after uh, Daring Don't, Mm -hmm. assuming that episode has already come and gone, why is Applejack going owie whatsy? She's met the dude. She can't pronounce it with themes, but she's met the guy. And this is is that whole double edge of continuity. They reference um, power ponies, talking about the spell that brought them into the comic book world. Yes, so if you reference one, unfortunately, fans are going to hold it as a rule. You have to take the rest of continuity. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. The episode already happened because that was episode four. Power Ponies was episode six. It already happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she should have known about that with all. Yeah, but uh, if you think about it, did did Applejack knew who Arizoto was? Like, did they mention him by name a few times so that it could hammer into Applejack's mind? She can't pronounce it. She's, I think, in the, uh, I think in the ep- in the TV episode, she's like, not so fast, Alan. What's it? <laughs> yeah, she's like, but, drop that thing now. We, whatever your name is. <laughs> so it's you know it's it's just a small tripping point, but it shows that what happens when you just when you bring in, oh, we're referencing this from the show, 
Well, fans are going to want to hold you to a lot more than just that. Hmm. Because we're impossible like that. Mm. You know, uh, regarding uh, my opinion on the comic, I think I wasn't... Um, I wasn't... I, I, yeah, I was saying, yeah, it has a lot of good content in that there is a reference to Game of Thrones in this comic, oh, yeah, okay? yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a moment where we can see a Voldemort pony oh, yeah. hanging out with a Fabio pony, <laughs> the pony version of the uh, of Maleficent, mm. and, uh, and uh, the, the pony version of Gollum, oh, and no. they are all hanging out around a, around a dining table. Don't there is Loki. What, yeah, the, the, Loki is there as well, Loki pony. So it's like, in terms of visual content and all that, this comic is amazing. It looks beautiful. It looks creative. I love the idea of being able to jump from book to book. It's kind of like jumping from din- from dream to dream or universe to universe. Mm-hmm. It is something that I love to see both in comic books, movies, and stories. However, writing-wise, the comic is a complete and utter mess. Yeah, I agree. In that it doesn't explain why this is happening. Like Silver was saying, it doesn't explain how the cocoons work. It, it mixes uh, fantasy elements with sci- science fiction elements. And it is true. Technobabble exists for a reason. <laughs> Most of the Technobabble is bullcrap. None of it makes <laughs> a lot of sense. But it's there to kind of like give an explanation to the fiction and put in some of the science. Mm. That's the, the existence of science fiction. This comic doesn't have any of that. Mostly because, you know, children's comic book is supposed to be simple. But ki- kids and children, they are, they are smart. They are intelligent. They can fill in the gaps as good as any adult. Why not put in some techno bubble in there so you can, you can say, oh, you see, the war meets spews that because uh, blah, 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 reasons. I'm not a biologist. My sister is. <laughs> but you can put in there some, some techno bubble to explain why of this situation. They don't. They just keep throwing more stuff at you, which is not – it's a it's candy. It's cool. It's pretty. But it, it always leaves your brain wondering, oh, why is this happening? Also, the character of the bookworm, we know nothing of it as, a, as an entity. We know nothing of it as a character. We just know that he likes to eat books. Mm. And we know that he's vengeful and that he wants to take it back on everyone who uh, – uh, who humiliated him? I don't think so. I think he's a bit selfish because there's there's no point in the story where he was humiliated by others. Uh, he's just vengeful because from all the books he ate, there's no hero or there's no one book starring a worm. That's about it. That's the only uh, motivation that he's running on. He is vengeful because there's no he worm as a hero. That's about it. Although it's hard to view him as a hero after he tried to drown Twilight and Company within the Daring Do phase. Hmm. Yeah, I mean he's yeah. the one who. I mean, I, I get that he, selfishness. I think would be a good motivation. That he's kind of egocentric. Mm-hmm. But when he's going on about I'm the hero and it's like. Just tried to drown my favorite ponies. Yeah, no, not but... only that, but he 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 tried to drown to drown them. He deleted one of uh, uh, Pinkie Pie's hooves. <laughs> deleted. And yeah, yeah, he totally erased it. And then he lay, he lev- leaves them on limbo. Mm. Not only that, but he also ge- uh, unleashes the forces of evil and destruction all over Ponyville. Mm-hmm. And he uh, he destroys pretty much all, if not uh, almost all of them, if not all of the books inside Twilight's library. Which, to be perfectly honest, that is almost as heartless and 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 evil as what Tyrek did destroying the library at the end of season four. No, that I mean, much really. No, no, no. Seriously, this and this is this is what pisses me off about this one character. The the bookworm idea is great as an idea. It sucks as a character. Because then they have to, they want to make us feel pity for him. Oh, look at him. He's crying. He feels bad. We're going to redeem him after two comic book issues. Yeah, I'm sure that's how it works. This is, that started a trend in the MLP comics at least, where we present a character for two issues and then we're going to redeem him in the last three pages. That's something that happened in, in, in uh, later comics. I'm not going to say which ones, but there has been a couple already that do that. With the bookworm, like, him being uh, pity for we, we felt pity for him later on blah 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 all this stuff it kind of works which is a bit manipulative at point but this reminds me of the one Doctor Who special the Christmas special <clears throat> the one that's starring Matt Smith with Scrooge and whatnot. it reminds me of that where he 
um, the character Ebenezer Scrooge didn't want to help the family out, and Doctor Who went back to his childhood and manipulated him so that he will help. It feels that way. I'm afraid I'm I'm not really sympathetic to the worm myself. Mostly again because of the aforementioned drowning. Mm. It's also kind of paradoxical when he says, I never meant to hurt anyone. I was just giving you a bubble bath. Um, (laughs) But but the thing with Scrooge is the whole point of that story was to redeem his character. The goal for Matt Smith, the doctor, was to influence and try and improve him. Uh, This book presents that the goal is to stop the worm. It's not really setting him up as a tragic figure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is this is how you fix it. Th- that's a very good point. If you think about a Christmas Carol and you focus on the character of Ebenezer Scrooge, the first time you see Ebenezer Scrooge, you hate him because he is self-centered. He is materialistic. He only likes money. He doesn't like to help others. He wants just to be rich and he doesn't care about anybody else. But then, when they go back to his life, when they go back to the past, then you learn that uh, he was kick back and forth that he didn't have the best childhood he actually had a terrible childhood he didn't have a very good teenage years either he became a he he started like every one of us with the potential of being a good person but circumstances in his life turn him into what he is right now which is what happens to everybody everybody can have a bad time that is so terrible that if you do not recover from that you can become a egotistical self-centered jerk which is what happened with Ebenezer Scrooge. It's about redeeming him by showing what's going to happen to him in the future. They don't do that with the bookworm. The bookworm is just... A, he's an object. He's a thing. He's a, he's a literary uh, resource. That, and he's a threat. Never he is a character. We never go back to see the bookworm being laughed at in school because he's trying to enjoy a book about a, a prince saving a princess. And then he gets just he's, he gets laughed at because they are like, ah, you can never be a prince. They should have done that. If they oh, showed the, if they showed the bookworm uh, being treated like dirt, it should have been a much better uh, a, a much better arc. Hmm. Well, it's yeah, it's the story. But all in all, to me, the ending for this book was touchy. It. it Pull on my heartstrings. Meet me Show here. me on the doll where the story touched you. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh <God> wow. <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> but anyway, I went there and I don't apologize. <laughs> yeah. Show me on the pony toy where the story touched you. Oh boy. <laughs> but anywho, um, besides the flaw in the villain here, like looking at the story, like breaking it down, I see that there's two villains in the story. One's an awesome looking villain, the other one is Mech, and the awesome looking villain was Maleficent. Are you sure that's a villain? Kind of. She's been playing the villain since the very beginning. We should unless, see- unless she's played by Angelina Jolie. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh gosh. Don't get me started on that movie. <laughs> I didn't hate it, but I don't. I didn't love it either. <laughs> um, no, it's like you, we have to. You have to. We have to sit down here and the, the, uh, think about what is a villain. Mm. Uh, a, a villain is the the opposite of a hero, and the one thing that those two types of uh, uh, personality have in common is that they are both characters. They are characters within a story. You cannot have a villain without a hero, and you cannot have a hero without a villain. They need each other. They are necessary. Maleficent is not a villain in the MLP comics. She has the same purpose as a time bomb. Now, you wouldn't take a time bomb that, you know, with straps of dynamite, a timer on it that is ticking down and all that. You wouldn't take a time bomb and call it a villain, right? Is it just a Malef- device? Maleficent, yeah, she's a device. Maleficent in the comics has the same purpose as if uh, she's the threat that is about to take over the over the, the town and she has to get rid of. Mm, true, true. You can call a time bomb an antagonist as it's a force that your protagonist is working against. Yes. Or is yeah, working is... against. But again, that doesn't require any sort of consciousness or personality. Although is it sad that I actually can point to a, a bomb with a personality in, in fiction? 
Sure. Oh, are we Ooh. talking about are we talking about Dark Star? Oh my God, there's two. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, huh? there is a nineteen there is a nineteen seventy nine movie called Dark Star, uh, done by the guy who wrote Alien, and uh, it's about the spaceship that is deploying bombs to destroy planets, and one of the bomb de- bon- one of the bombs de- uh, develops a conscience. Well, that's got that's got to stink. But I was I was thinking of Andy from uh, Red vs. Blue, hmm. a bomb with <laughs> personality who's kind of a jerk, but well, when you're when you're made to blow up, I think you're allowed a personality issue. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're allowed to have a, a couple of flaws if you're made to destroy things. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Actually, boy. wait, no, I can think of three bombs. Wow, I know one conscious bomb. Oh, wait, one, two conscious bombs. No, three. Bomberman? <laughs> to the world of uh, comic books, there was actually a Transformer uh, in, the, um, in the current IDW arc. Who transformed into a bomb? What? <laughs> really? Megatron had some issues in the war. He created an entire generation of living bomb transformers. What? Oh my god, that is horrible! <laughs> that was Megatron. <laughs> yeah, I know, but holy cow! Even for Megatron, that is terrible. We are, we are drifting away. Uh, <laughs> I know, but I just want to say how weird it is that I can now point to three bombs with consciousness in fiction. We've got issues as a species. <laughs> well, wait, 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 wait. Are, one more, one no, more, one I, no, more. I think I like. I think I like the idea of bombs that acquire consciousness because it's like we are very paranoid about our creations taking control of us, especially if they can destroy us. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Oh boy. But Norman, you said there's a fourth bomb, which well, now I sound like a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Bomberman, remember him? The oh next God. One. <laughs> are we really going there, Norman? Why not, right? <laughs> Are we talking about the Bomberman from like the classic video games or the 2006 Bomberman? No, not that one. The classic ones from the NES and oh. Super NES. 2006 was such a bad year for video games, oh, wasn't it? Yeah, Sonic, Sonic 06. Sonic, Bomberman, Bomberman. Good grief. No. Oh no, that's not okay. Moving on, moving on. This comic yeah, was. We're this comic. comic was awesome. This comic was awesome. <laughs> Although, can we talk about Twilight's um, team choices and that maybe she needs to work on that? <laughs> Well, yeah. Uh, Be- because this is the funny thing. All right. uh, Normally, I don't like fixate on the writer in a comic. I just want to talk about the comic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but since the writer here was the same person who wrote the pirate arc, mm-hmm. I just noticed a strange parallel. When the ponies went ashore to the Galloping Ghost Islands, and they, they encountered all the, the pirates' den, like the One Piece ponies, mm-hmm. it was Twilight. Rarity, Rainbow Dash, Pinky. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Twilight oh, yeah. goes into the books now and brings along the exact same team. Oh. I feel a little jilted that uh, Applejack, uh, Fluttershy, and Spike are left behind once again to either mind the shop or need rescuing. Oh, yeah. I, I noticed that. It feels. It just feels like, wow, we don't want to change things up just a little. Oh my god, you're right. I didn't realize. That is so true. But but do you think this is the weakness of the writer that she don't know how to write Applejack and Fluttershy and Spike? So um, the best thing I to do is not include them? I don't think so. Well, they are... The show itself seems to struggle. I, you know, when I've, I've done a, a big spiel about Applejack and how she's sort of the, the straight man mayor mm-hmm. of the group. That basically everyone can be a little crazy because she's the even keel. Mm-hmm. That makes it hard to write her in a kooky story of her own. But at the same time, and Fluttershy, well, she's she's just you know shy and poor Spike, <laughs> poor Spike. But at the same Spike time, isn't 50 real. <laughs> at the same time, if you're going into a world where things are zany and things are out of almost out of control on their own. That almost sounds like the perfect setting for Applejack and Fluttershy. One playing the straight mare to the world, and the other giving sort of these little freakouts or the other Fluttershy extreme, dominating them with her sheer brute force. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just feel like, what a, what a wasted opportunity. And yet, I will admit that in the latter half, it was fun seeing how the three most imaginative members of the main six... Uh, created these stories so that worked 
But first they had to make a mess of everything because they can't keep on track. Mm. Yeah, well, is that the well the reason why they they first make a mess out of everything because they cannot keep on track is mostly because Twilight is kind of fighting against them. Because mm-hmm. Twilight is like, no, keep it everything as it was. Don't touch anything. Don't change anything. Why when you listen to me, you have to do what I'm telling you. It's not until Twilight is like, hey, you know what? You're right. Maybe your approach is better. That things get uh, kind of like improved, although temporarily, because then it's it's thanks to Fluttershy and Applejack that the day is saved, really. Yeah. Who knew uh, Fluttershy could draw so well? It's so cute. <laughs> I know she's a she's a pony of many talents, most of which get ignored. Yeah, poor thing. Yeah, well, she's she the... can sing, she can draw, she can make knitting. She mm-hmm. is good with fashion, at least demanding it and criticizing it, not throwing it. Mm-hmm. That, that's, yeah. Oh gosh, but... in French haute couture. <laughs> French hot couture, please. Uh, but yeah, that is a very good point, actually. Why would they choose uh, these characters instead of? the others in order to uh, to tackle this issue yeah. i have no idea why to be perfectly on for, to be perfectly honest with you okay uh, okay guys okay guys um if if we could select four ponies to go with twilight into the book who would you pick are you four talking about main six or background as well the main six like for this story like the writer here she picked um twilight obviously twilight rainbow dash pinkie pie and rarity but if you were given the choice who would you pick Fluttershy, 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 and Fluttershy. Hmm. You can only pick one, <laughs> Silver. You can only pick the same four times. Because fanboy. Uh, oh, come on. In that case, I say rarity, 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 rarity. No, no, no. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see. Well, I think in some ways it makes a lot of sense to leave Applejack behind because she is sort of second in command, mm-hmm. in a sense. So I can see that. But in, at the same time, she's also a very stable and reliable pony, which is what you want in a crazy situation. In fact, uh, she might have been, made a good balance as Twilight was starting to lose her her focus. So I will say, in this case, bring Applejack. There's plenty of other ponies in Ponyville to mind the shop. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Applejack, Rarity, and it's a tough call, but I actually would bring... Rainbow, just because you'd need. Then you'd have an Earth Pony, a Unicorn, and a Pegasus to help your Alicorn. Mm, true, 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 true. And Jean? Now, do we only have to pick four, or can we just, uh, like Silver did, pick three? Yeah, you know what? Oh. Go for how many you'd like. Um, I will pick Rainbow Dash because she's the muscle, fast. She can fly. She has very good reflexes. And if things come to come to worst, she can use the Sonic Rainbow to get out of the situation to make a fast escape. Mm-hmm. Uh, Applejack, level-headed, she will be able to come up with good um, uh, good strategies or take over uh, over the team when Twilight is over her head. And uh, I will pick Pinkie Pie because even though she can be crazy and random, she has the Pinkie sense that can predict things to uh, fall or happen. So she could be good at surveillance besides her fourth wall breaking powers. Mm-hmm. She will be able to, uh, 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 we will, like, the team will be able to take advantage of that. Also, an endless supply of costumes and uh, sneaking, <laughs> at, uh, sneaking devices, including <laughs> stealth suits and Fluttershy suits. Oh, boy. So, yeah, <laughs> all right, all right. I'll, yeah that, that, will, that will be my team. I will leave Rarity out because Prissy Girl, she will be too focused on the dra- dra- uh, draping of the uh, curtains rather <laughs> than, you know... Uh, <laughs> it is true. She might be my favorite, but true, she's true. very absent-minded. And I will leave Fluttershy out because in a very tight, tight difficult situation, Fluttershy might be the first one to bail out. Uh, mm. She's not the. She's not Saddle Rager. She will not be... Um, you don't like me when I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't want that. Right. Uh, so yeah, that will be my team. Uh, as for me, if I were to pick my team for Twilight, it would be Rarity and Spike. Rarity and Spike? Yeah. So her number one assistant, and I can understand that, that you know he's probably read as many of these books as, as Twilight, but why Rarity? 
Well, because rarity is the um, next unicorn in the group because you're dealing with magic. So at least you need someone who can help Twilight with the magics. Well, oh you know God. that although if Rarity got cast as the princess in the tower in that initial story, Spike would be the dragon guarding her. Yeah, true. But I don't know, I mean uh, He'd this... probably say, Yeah, I'm good here. Yeah, I mean, you go on ahead, Twilight. <laughs> <laughs> this this is just my opinion because like it um, will be difficult though because Rarity will be distracted with the with the clothes and Spike will be distracted with Rarity. Yeah, they will but, not be helping. But James, the story already includes Rarity. And it already yeah, is. But, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I, I like Rarity the first guy I'm the first guy to say that Rarity is best pony, but she <laughs> is also very useless when it comes to an action situation. Oh, true. Just but, think about it. But only she's speaking, right? I mean if I were to pick again, I would just say Twilight and Spike because those two are the professional bookworms of the library. They know the book in and out. So, for, the, for those of you listening who may be wondering why are these guys bantering about, is that we can come up with much better teams to tackle this comic book and still make it entertaining than the mm. team that we are given. Yeah, but still, it's not bad. What we are given is not bad, but... It is not bad, but it could have been so much better. Mm-hmm. That's the point, mm-hmm. is that you don't look at Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and say, oh, it's not bad, and then don't add immediately after, but it could have been so much better. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. There, are, there are many things in this comic that could have been so much better. The writing could have been so much better. The villain could have been so much better. The characters could have been so much better. The situation could have been so much better. The resolution could have been so much better. The one thing that couldn't have been better is the visuals and the, the way the comic was drawn. That is flawless. Mm-hmm. But everything else... Ah, needs improvement. Yeah, Come true, back. True. See, see, see me after class. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. But overall, we're nearing the end. And like we mentioned this before, Twilight brainwashes the worm to become good. And story ends. We also learned that Twilight herself, is, for her avid love of books, she's not much of a storyteller herself. <laughs> Which makes sense. She's more analytical. She's mm-hmm. really great at writing reports, just not... Uh, just not concocting a tale. True, true. I'm surprised that she didn't start off with a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And th- there is one other thing that I just kind of scratched my head over. Which is when they first when they first enter the book, hmm? they gather hands and they and they have the whoosh. The first thing they do is when they're on the page with all the torn edges. Mm-hmm. Rarity comments, "Well, we at least look the part." Oh yeah. And when you that. look at them. They have fetlocks, I mean, the f- which, which is oh. normal, which is normally reserved for stallions or at least the big Macintosh body types. I so didn't notice that. I need to look at it. And I thought to myself, okay, they have fetlocks. I are fetlocks part of equestrian fantasy? Yeah, and if so, f- what are when, oh. what are the mayors of Pointeville dreaming about big Macintosh then? <laughs> I, I got no idea how to tackle this one because, um, honestly speaking, I got no good answer. Because um, on a slight story, our good friend, Lionheart Cartoon, recently did a new style for Fluttershy in his Us Baby Discord update. And she has the same looks like we're talking about right now. Oh, so she has fat locks. Mm-hmm. You know, it, I'm, I'm with you. I can't really give a, a why this is or an idea of what it's supposed to represent. Mm. I will say that when you mention art styles, I, I'm i actually not as big a fan of artwork that makes the, our ponies look more like real horses, mm. which sounds paradoxical, I mean, which I was called My Little Pony. <laughs> I guess I'm not really eager to see a biologically correct pony. I, I enjoy this cartoonish... Um, this cartoonish representation. Oh, true, true. I, I agree with you there. But uh, I, I, that's not to say I discourage people. I've seen some truly beautiful artwork where they are look more like real horses. It's just not my personal thing. Mm-hmm. But uh, I honestly can't say why having fetlocks is an important part of looking uh, like, a, like a hit fantasy character. Well, it could be one of those fantasy story thingies you know it's hard for me to explain you know what I'm, you you guys talk about this because i want to try and look for something carry on carry on well it is it is true is that uh 
I think it's, I don't know, part of the seeing something, that, seeing the familiar, because in real life you can see that both male and female horses, they have fetlocks. There is, like, no female horses don't fa- have fetlocks in real life. That is that is part of how a horse looks like. So I think it's adding more elements to the familiar, increases the the feel of fantasy to it. Or maybe we are all thinking about The Last Unicorn, which is a character that is... Uh, that does have fetlocks, and she's still a, a, a fantasy animal. And she drove Nash to cry. Uh, yeah. Oh gosh. Which, or, or rather, well, I don't know how many of our listeners uh, watch um, "Here Be Dragons" on that kind of glasses, but I so enjoy it. <laughs> I watch it when I watch it whenever I have the time. I really like Nash actually, but. Um, I actually prefer to watch his podcast. I, I, I am not going to say the, ta- the, the, the title because <laughs> it has a swear word in it. But what is wrong with you? What, what is wrong with you people? With you? <laughs> yes, I yeah. really like that one. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree is that the more of the familiar you add to a fantasy character, the more fantasy character, it, the more fantasy it looks like. I know it's weird, but that's all. That's how. That's how it works. This is something that happened in the in the movie adaptation of the Lord of the Rings. If you watch the documentaries, if you watch the making ofs of um, uh, the Lord of the Rings movies, at least the the three first, uh, you will realize that they are not making a fantasy movie. They are trying to shoot it like it's a documentary. They are trying to make it real. Wow. They go for make it like as realistic and grounded in reality as possible. Um, that's that's why all the armor, all the all the swords, all of the uh, all of the uh, scenarios and all of the stages and uh, uh, sets, they all look so real because they are chock full of detail. So I think that's why uh, the more of the familiar you add to a fantasy character, the more fantasy it looks. I totally ranted on that. What, do I, what are you looking for, Norman? I am looking for the Saddle Arabian Pony. Oh, oh yes. that's... Who, who looks so much more like an actual horse. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm trying to look at the female horse because she... I want to see if she has fret box on If you can recognize her, by the way. <laughs> oh, I can. Oh, I can. Here, I can. And, yep, she does. She does. Huh. Curiosity. Does she, does she now? Well, it, it's not 100% fret locks, but it looks like she has hooves. What episode are you looking at for? Like in... Um... Game, game ponies, ponies play. Sp- Let me link game to you guys. Po- no, no, you're talking about the e- quest- Sorry, no, um, Equestria games. Yeah, yeah I yeah, was sorry. thinking the, 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 the Saddle Arabian horses didn't show up in games ponies play. My bad. Yeah, here, here you go. There's a picture for you. Well, audience, I'm sorry. You have to go look for yourself. But yes, um, the pink horse has kind of hooves, but there's no fretlocks like Prince Bluebird. But still, I can understand why. And if you think about it in a fantasy setting, yeah. It kind of works, maybe. Wow, sir. So didn't expect that. But anyway, we have reached the end of the comic. What do we think? I leave myself for last. Alrighty then, I shall go first. So, I think that the story was a bit rocky at some parts. The art is really nice. Overall, it's a nice read. If you can not question a lot of things, it's a nice read. Silva? I agree. It's fun to see the ponies in different environments, as Star Trek personnel, as adventurers, as heroes who cure zombies with rainbows. Why have we never tried that? <laughs> Seriously, why not? Nothing else is working. But, uh, <laughs> but I feel like this story, they said, hey, we really want to show these ponies in those situations. Okay, here's something about a book form that, that slaps them all in there. And it kind of went, so they started with what they wanted and worked backwards from there. So the story doesn't feel as tight as it could. It's a fun spectacle, but not, in my eyes, a solid story. I definitely agree with what you said right there. And I will actually add, uh, my my opinion is pretty much what Silver just said. But I'm just going to pointify a couple of things in that uh, visually it looks great. It's it's awesome to see all of those uh, pony fight versions of famous and well known literary characters in there. Like the fact that there is a Daenerys Targaryen pony with three dragons flying around her, it's just an absolute treat. 
Uh, <laughs> I just, I, I just cannot get over it. There is a Game of Thrones reference in My Little Pony. That is something that I wouldn't have even imagined. Uh, but <laughs> narratively speaking, the comic is a mess. It doesn't have pacing. It ends very abruptly. It starts very abruptly. It doesn't mm. feel like anything was accomplished towards the end, except, you know, getting things back to status quo. Uh, the characters didn't change. The, the, actually, the, the interaction between the characters is pretty much dry. And the story is just an excuse to throw reference in and reference out, which it's fine, but when you have so much richness going on for it, it's kind of like a wasted opportunity. So, yeah, comic looks great. I don't hate it. I enjoy it. I will read it any other time, but it's not one of my favorites. It's definitely on the bottom of the list of the comic books. Like, if there was a bad comic book or whatever so far, there hasn't been. Uh, to me, mm-hmm. such, but that one is that one is uh, close to the bottom than to the top. Although I will also add that I'm glad Daenerys was the only reference in Game of Thrones to make it in. Otherwise, oh, yeah. we'd have we'd have a pretty high body count of ponies. Oh, yeah, God. No, not only that, but you will have to bump the rating from a PG comic or a G comic to a what rated X? Like <laughs> seriously, things get very hairy on Game on Game of Thrones. That is... Oh God, no, 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 no! Moving on, moving on, moving on. <laughs> Princess Celestia attends the red wedding. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! But then, oh who ratings? What do we give? I, I give it. Ten, I give it uh, seven traumatized audience members out of ten. <laughs> 7 out of 10 uh, James? Uh, I will give it uh, 6 cocoons out of 10 I'll give it a bit higher 8 it's not bad but it's not good it's in the middle it's an enjoyable read the art is good that's about it okay fair enough mm-hmm. so James what's the next oh, one? oh gosh is that it we, we went through that one fairly fast for a two issue comic uh, so <laughs> yeah. next comic that we're going to be reviewing and not to break the fantasy of the moment I'm going to say that we're reviewing this one next week uh, we will be reviewing the MLP micro series issue number six focused around Applejack uh, Yay. yes that one is going to be an interesting take especially since we have <laughs> an Applejack yep. enthusiast uh, with us yeehaw <laughs> <laughs> All right, but uh, I think that's it. Today. That's it for today's uh, comic review. Oh, wait, before we move on, before we move oh, on, oh, um, the next one after the Applejack Micro is going to be one of the most interesting arcs out there. Oh, Ooh. what is that? Yep. What is that arc, Norman? The reflections arc. Oh, the reflections. I arc. didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you. What a twist! What a twist! <laughs> No, it's very funny. I will explain to you why I find that funny that you made that reference. <laughs> All right, uh, later on, when the people cannot see it, so they... <laughs> ah, 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 you cannot know it. All right, but yeah, I think that's it for today's uh, review. Uh, this has been James Cork. And I am Norman Sanzo. And I am Silver Quill. And that's it for today. Thank you guys for watching and listening, and we'll see you all next week. Toodles! Bye-bye! Adios! Adios!